I guess my theatrical journey started in the fields of Delano. Notice the actors with character signs around their necks, so it's clear who they are and what they want. What they wanted was more than just entertain the audience. The audience, poor Mexican farm workers, learned thanks to the actors in play that they have the right to unionize. El Teatro Campesino was formed by Luis Valdez, who helped Cesar Chavez unionize farm workers through the theater, a theater created out of the need to educate and inspire with music, Comedia del Arte, and large doses of Bertel Brecht. This is the birth of Chicano theater. While those brave pioneers performed on flatbed trucks, I was a San Francisco boy watching TV shows that had a profound effect on me. The Andy Griffith Show, Leave it to Beaver, Wild Wild West, Lost in Space, and F Troop. Silly shows performed by great character actors. The world changed when the Beatles invaded our bilingual living rooms. I went local with the British invasion and it changed how I saw and heard the world. The absurdity and smarts of Monty Python's Flying Circus was a major influence on my future comedy. While I was attending art school, the Americas were awakening and rising from 500 years of colonialism and the Cold War was reignited. I went to Cuba to see the revolution firsthand. Chile, Nicaragua, and El Salvador were deep in bloody civil wars. The table was set for three bilingual urban Chicanos to emerge out of San Francisco's performance art and stand-up comedy scenes. They were young, brash, and irreverent. They were culture clash. Richard, son of Chicano poetry legend Jose Montoya, bilingual rapper Rick Slick Salinas, and me, master of disguises. Our hero Luis Valdez took us under his wing for a year, and we performed in every small town along California's burrito belt of cultural centers and junior colleges. The Marx Brothers meets the Rolling Stones were the headlines, and we lived up to the hype. Back on Broadway, Luis Valdez shows a confused and weary Cesar Chavez the Great White Way, where Chicanos were not allowed to dance, sing, and tell their stories. Meanwhile, in LA, Culture Clash found out with Cheech Marin that Hollywood didn't want Chicanos on TV either. We conquered Los Angeles on stage with a bowl of beans that was filmed for PBS Grand Performances. Hollywood came sniffing around, but we weren't selling out. Instead, we went back to Theater Row and produced ourselves. Some hip Fox executives came around and gave us our own groundbreaking sketch show. Regional theaters all over the country wanted The Clash to bring their subscribers some much needed culture and laughter. And after 36 years, we're still together, and dare I say it, still relevant and necessary. This is a recent photo of us performing Culture Clash Still in America in Orange County and Berkeley. It was time to leave the nest and see if I could fly solo. I went back to basics and I wrote and performed the tribute to Mario Moreno Cantinflas, the Charlie Chaplin of Mexico. He spoke Spanish a mile a minute and danced a mean cumbia as his pants slipped down to his knees. While I was doing old school comedy, Richard wrote a Pulitzer worthy drama called Water and Power, a dark Chicano drama about the city of angels and civic corruption. It was our first dramatic piece together and we even got some respect from the haters who said we couldn't do anything else but comedy. Our last collectively written play was our Los Angeles masterpiece called Chavez Ravine. The play is about eminent domain, the death of public housing, and the welcoming of the Brooklyn Dodgers to Los Angeles. This play attracted a large Chicano audience to the Mark Taper Forum, like Zoot Suit had done 20 years earlier. When I was seven years old, I saw a photography book called The Private Life of Pablo Picasso by Douglas Duncan. I told my mom, when I grow up, I wanna be like this old man. Well, I guess I did. A weekend with Pablo Picasso took me my whole life to write and perform. I have a hate-love relationship with Shakespeare. The language intimidates me and it might as well be French. Once I understood what Will was saying, his universal story of family, country, and honor fascinated me. I adapted Henry IV into a post-gringo, post-apocalyptic Chicano version called El Henry. 
Remember the Occupy movement? Seems like ancient lefty history now. I wrote Steel Heaven in response to this well-intentioned movement without a leader. An American protester is killed by police and goes to heaven to be retrained by 60s bad boy, Abby Hoffman. You remember Abby. In 2017, I was awarded a prestigious playwright in residence grant by the Mellon Foundation. This grant allowed me to just focus and write plays. My adaptation of Moliere's imaginary invalid was set in early California before the gringo invasion. It was called Manifest Destinitis. Pixar Studios invited me to their Emeryville campus to check out rough sketches and ideas for a Dia de los Muertos film they were developing. While I was around the table, I said, I can do voices, you know. And two months later, I voiced the twin uncles, Tio Oscar and Tio Felipe for the Oscar-winning animated film, Coco. With the success of Manifest Destinitis, I went back to the Moliere well and wrote the first narco novella comedy called Bad Hombres, Good Wives. Now, if you look at the picture, I see Monty Python, I see Carol Burnett, I see El Teatro Campesino on the dusty fields of Delano making audiences laugh and think, that's my theater.